Hello everyone, my name is Darya, welcome back to my channel. And you guys, hi! I know I already said that, but I'll say it again, hi, how are you? How's life? How you doing? It has been roughly two months since I last posted here, since I last checked the comments, replied to comments, I've been away for a few reasons. I don't plan on going into too many details, but it was for mental health reasons, it was for school related reasons, and just, you know, feeling like it, it was time for me to take a bit of a purposeful break for the first time ever. So that's what I did. And I feel rejuvenated. I'm so happy to be back. I kept asking myself, like, what is going to be the video that I make? What's going to be the topic that I come back with after being away for so long? And I was so sure that it would be Bridgerton related because the Queen Charlotte spinoff is coming out, or maybe it's already out by the time this video goes up. But then an absolute gem fell into my lap and I just had to take advantage of it. So today we are going to be discussing Beautiful Disaster, both the book and the recently released adaptation. This is joining the pantheon of videos on my channel. It's like a staple on my channel, this genre in which I read and then explain to you guys the summary of like really terrible toxic romance novels and then I live react to what is likely the equally terrible adaptation. What makes me so intrigued by Beautiful Disaster is that if I didn't know better, I would think it was somehow some sort of spinoff of the after films for many reasons, but the primary one being that the lead actor in this film is Dylan Sprouse, who also had like a small uh, stint in the second after movie. And also I'm fairly certain that Beautiful Disaster is produced by the same company that produced all the after films. I'm also very intrigued by this adaptation because from what I've seen from like trailers and a couple like teasers that have been released of this movie, it seems wildly different from the novel. And having finished the novel, while I'm sitting here filming this intro, having finished the novel, I can just say, God bless for that. Thank God. I have a really interesting history with the Beautiful Disaster book, actually. I think I read it for the first time, like, the summer of 2015, I believe. I was 16 years old, seven, about to turn 17, and it was, like, the first romance book I ever read in a long time, and also the first ever romance book I read because of, like, booktube and the internet. It's, like, a core memory for me, and not in a good way, because I was driving to work in the middle of the hot California summer, my car had no AC and it was falling apart at the seams. I had to prop up my seat with a box and I was listening to this audiobook and hating every second of it. That was a very formative experience for me. And I hated that book when I was 16 and now I'm 24 reading it again and um, I hate it even more. Like I hate it even more. So the book opens up and we are immediately introduced to our protagonist, Abby Abernathy. And she is a 19 year old college student. I believe she's a freshman or a sophomore, something like that. And she is hanging out with her friend, her childhood friend, America and America's boyfriend, Shepley. And they have showed up to this underground like fighting ring that exists at their college. Don't ask me how this like fight club got started. Don't ask me any of the lore surrounding it. The function of the fight club is just to um, show off the uh, like sexual appeal of our main male hero. Don't ask me how watching a man beat another man to a pulp for fun and leisure is somehow meant to um, arouse me, but um, that was the goal of creating this like fight club. And speaking of our male hero, we are introduced to him via Abby. She is like totally in awe of this man. His name is Travis Maddox. His name in the fighting ring is Travis Mad Dog Maddox. And Abby is just like absolutely taken by Travis watching him like fight this uh, varsity football player or something. She's just entranced by the masculine energy that he's exuding and he's also a conventionally attractive white man, so there's that. In the midst of all the chaos that's happening, Abby ends up getting like tossed around a bit by the crowd and she also gets like some blood on her, I believe, from the fight. And Travis notices and kind of like tells everybody to like back off her. And this is how they first meet. And this is also the instance where he first uses a nickname that has haunted me since summer 2015. He calls her Pigeon. But wait, but wait, okay, you think, you think Pigeon is bad enough? Like Pigeon, what kind of a fucking nickname is that? Of all the birds that you could call someone, why Pigeon? Um, it gets worse because <laughs> he then shortens that nickname 
to page. Okay, moving on. Um, I'm gonna keep saying that because if if I if I get stuck talking about like one horrible detail and aspect about this book, I will never finish this video. So chugging along um, into the next moment of fuckery. So there's like a couple scenes after this. I don't have them written down in my notes because obviously they weren't important enough to remember. It was pretty much just like a bunch of establishing scenes showing that Travis is like this like it guy on campus. He's the bad boy. He's dangerous. All the girls want to have sex with him apparently and all the dudes are like afraid of him and Abby and him sort of strike up this weird like friendship slash flirting relationship mostly on his side actually not all on her side and pretty much in every scene that Travis is featured in there's always some like anonymous nameless girl who comes up to him and very like heavy-handedly flirts with him and you know tries to get with him and Abby is always there, you know, our trusted protagonist who, you know, whose mind we live inside. It's a wonderful place to be. She is always there to slut shame those girls, like without fail. If you're a woman in this novel and you are not America or Abby, you are a no good, dumb ass bimbo slut. Like you are a whore who has no self-respect. I'm sorry to tell you that, I am, but but that is just, that is who you are as a person. So like I mentioned, Abby and Travis have this weird flirting relationship. She shows up to Travis's apartment and purposefully like doesn't put on makeup, wears her glasses, like makes herself look as like schlumpy as possible so not to invite his attention. And baby girl, if a man is gonna sexualize you, he will do it no matter what you're wearing, no matter where you are, no matter who you are or what you look like, that will not stop them. I am sorry to tell you. <laughs> so moral of the story is don't dress for men. Don't dress for men, period, point blank. Travis ends up inviting Abby to like go out to dinner and sort of like reassures her that it's just between friends. So she goes and during this dinner, he just like trauma dumps on her. And I'm pretty sure they've only known each other for like a week, if that, maybe two weeks. And yeah, he's just telling her all about his alcoholic father and how his mom died and left like a gaping hole in their family and how there was no like nurturance or love growing up and that he had all these older brothers who like beat him up. And I'm not sure if that's meant to be, if it's like a funny thing, like they were just getting really rowdy. But from what I can understand, um, it wasn't like that. Like they were honest to God, like fighting each other every day in that house. And he was always getting beat up by his older brothers. And apparently still is. Which, um, is this what brothers do? Do brothers just beat each other up and then like it's fine and dandy? I don't think so. I'm going out on a limb here, but I don't think so. So at this point in the book, there's just a lot of pointless scenes in which we begin to establish a friendship between Abby and Travis. And he's like helping her study for bio exams and all this different things. And at this point I wrote in my notes, <laughs> I cannot believe I wrote this, okay? I wrote, Honestly, it's not that bad. He's pretty nice and yeah, the dialogue is cringy, but it's fine. Baby girl. I was really trying to give this book the benefit of the doubt. I thought I had such high hopes. I was so naive, so naive. The next significant thing to happen is that America and Abby, the water goes out in their dormitory and they end up like staying with Shepley and Travis in their apartment. And there's one night in which Travis brings a girl home and then the next morning she asks for his number and he just tells her like, nah, I'm good. And then after she leaves, Abby and Travis get into this like whole argument about how he treats women and about sexism and misogyny. And he basically says that he hasn't promised these girls anything. And then somehow the conversation devolves into once again, that girl being called a slut and a bimbo. And um, we were doing so well, Abby, you know, you were, you were doing so well, you were calling him out on his behavior. And then, and then somehow we just revert back to slut shaming because that is just, her default, I guess. We also find out at this point that apparently everybody at their university is talking about her and Travis because they know that she is like sharing his bed. That's another thing that they're doing. They're like sleeping in the bed together every night. They don't do anything, but yeah. And and apparently everybody at the university is talking about them, but like maybe it's the fact that I just go to a really large school. Uh, my college campus is made of tens of thousands of people, but I imagine even at like a smaller campus, no one gives a fuck. Like no one cares who is sleeping together, who isn't. Like how would enough people even know who you are? Like I do not know like 
99% of the people on my campus. Like I eventually the main four characters, Abby, America, Shepley and Travis all end up at this club and Abby and Travis end up dancing and while they're dancing, he gets a little bit like touchy with her and he kisses her neck and he whispers to her that he would like never treat her the way that he treats like the other girls in his life and that you know he's really attracted to her and whatever and Abby gets pissed off and storms off. At first she was pissed off because of the things that he said and then she gets mad because she sees him dancing with another girl similarly to how they were dancing and she gets mad and then eventually I'm not sure how this happens and it really doesn't matter but they end up making up but then they're right back to being like touchy-feely with each other and like I cannot stress to you how much I don't care. Like, I think we're supposed to like be really intrigued by like the push and pull of their relationship. Like, are they friends? Are they not? Apparently everybody on this fucking campus wants to know if they're friends or something more. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> like I, I just, and this becomes such like a, a, a big point in the novel. Like, are they friends? Are they not? Like this plot line, this question drags on for so fucking long. And I cannot tell you, like I couldn't give less of a fuck. And this is the point in the novel where I like retract on my previous statement of the book just being cringy and not as bad as I remember. It's bad. Like I write, it's so dumb, I take back what I said. It's just, it's bad. So Travis has a fight and Abby is there and they make a bet that if the guy he's fighting doesn't touch Travis like at all, then Abby will have to come live with him for a month or keep living with him for another month. And if Abby wins the bet and the guy does manage to touch and hit Travis during this fight, then Travis will have to go celibate for a month. And la di da, basically Travis ends up winning because the guy doesn't freaking touch him and Travis ends up like just kind of like wailing on this dude. Like it's a very intense fight and very one-sided. Like I said, the guy doesn't get a single, like not even a smack or a slap in. And I don't know about you guys, but like that would terrify me. <laughs> like if I saw even a friend of mine, let alone someone that I think of romantically, like just beat this dude to a fucking pulp. Like, and I know he does it for money. He like does it so that he can like pay for his room and, and his tuition and stuff. But like, even then, like Travis takes a lot of pleasure in hurting people. I feel like you kind of have to. And, and that, that is, um, how do you say? Very scary, terrifying. So they're towing this line between romance and friendship. And then Abby's friend, America confronts her about, you know, what's going on. And Abby basically says, I could never like actually be with him. He doesn't know how to commit, etc. And of course, Travis ends up overhearing this and he storms out of the apartment and Abby is like asleep in his slash their bed and she hears him bring home two girls and they have a threesome on the communal living room couch. And then the next morning, Travis shows up to the apartment early and he has like done a bunch of grocery shopping. He's bought Abby like all of her favorite foods. He's apologizing to her. And she basically says that he has nothing to apologize for because they're not together and they never will be. And at this point, hang it up. Like hang it the fuck up. I'm so sick of this like manufactured tension of whether or not they're together. Like at this point, I was like two hours into the audiobook. I couldn't care less. Like I really could not. So Abby starts dating this guy named Parker and he is everything that Travis is not. He is thoughtful, considerate, respectful, and you know, he's a good kisser and Abby seems to really like him. And of course this means that Travis hates his guts. And there's even one time when Abby and Parker are like outside of the apartment making out after a date and Travis comes, he's, dr he's like really drunk by the way. And he's like banging on the glass, telling Abby to come into the apartment. Abby surprisingly doesn't tell him to fuck off and actually listens to him and goes into the apartment. And then they get into a fight and the purity culture is just on full blast because he keeps going on about how she's better than some drunken hookup in a car. You know, you're not like those other girls, Madonna whore complex. And it's during this confrontation that Abby reveals that she is a virgin. And this man, he has stars in his eyes. Like he acts like that is the hottest, the sexiest, like the most incredible thing she could have ever said to him because of course this girl's a virgin. And of course the guy is like, obsessed with the fact that he's her first. I literally hate that. Like I, I hate it in these novels where so often the girl is, is not only like, it's not that she has never had sex, it's that she's like clueless about her body and like sex and sexuality in general. And then the guy is like falling over himself to like be the one to teach her. Eventually Parker tells Abby that he thinks that they should like press pause on whatever they're doing, whatever they are until the bed is over and she moves out of Travis's apartment. 
And then we sort of do like a bit of a time skip. And in the meantime, Abby and Travis have like continued being friends and stuff. They have this little like one-on-one -on -one dinner together. And uh, it's like, I think like her final night at the apartment and they end up having sex. And um, I don't know what you want me to say about that. Like it, it, it happened. It was boring and lackluster. All this tension, all this build up, all this will they, won't they back and forth. And then that is, is just like it done and dusted in a record amount of time. It was so painfully like uneventful. I don't know about you guys, but like if that was me, like if I was like a big fan of this book and like that was the sex scene that I finally had given to me, I would pack my shit up and leave. Like you are not about to do this to me. See, I'm used to these like, fan fictions on AO3 where like the tension's there, it's built up chapters and chapters and then the author finally delivers like a full chapter, 10k words, mature rating where the couple finally gets together and has sex. Like that is what I'm used to. Like I cannot imagine settling for this. So for Abby, this night that they spent together is kind of meant to act as like a bookend for their relationship and whatever they had going on. I don't think she really plans to like ever see him or speak to him again. So that very same night she asks America to take her back to her dorm, which she does. And then a scene comes up that is really the only scene that I remember in any sort of detail from the first time I read this book. I remember this scene so clearly because it scared the hell out of me. And all these years later, it still scares the hell out of me. Like this is the point in the book where we go from cringy and you know misogynist and, and gross to like actually terrifying call the fucking police get a restraining order so the next morning after she leaves abby is being bombarded by phone calls text messages and finally america shows up at her door and it's just like freaked the fuck out still in her pajamas and she's like what happened with travis what did you do she says that what did you do to him and we find out that apparently travis has trashed the apartment. He broke a mirror with his fists. He was like ripping, he ripped a door off his hinges. And when Shepley tried to like go towards him to get him to calm down, he swung at Shepley. And America has the audacity to ask Abby, what did you do? Like it's her fault that he did all that shit, that he went off that rampage. Like, girl. Abby then gets on the phone with Travis and he is so like, scary and adrenaline filmed on the phone and he basically like bombards her and bullies her into saying that they can keep being friends and eventually they can be together after she has some time away from him. After that phone call, America then turns to Abby and says like, you know, Travis has done so much to change for you. Like he's become such a good guy for you. Like, why don't you give him a chance, blah, blah, blah. And like, Abby, that is not your friend. America is not your friend. Because if my best friend, if that happened to my best friend, if I was in America's position, I would be taking her right down to the police station and getting a restraining order. Fuck off. He changed for you. He changed for you. Shut the fuck up. So Travis and Abby meet up and I can't remember if they meet up in a public place or at his house, but for her sake, I hope it was a public place. Eventually during that conversation, Travis figures out that she slept with him. It's kind of like a goodbye. And he's like, that's fine. You and I can like keep being friends and then I'm going to wear you down eventually and we'll be together. And I remember there's this one conversation that they have where like Travis tells Abby like, you're my everything. Like you're the reason that I don't have to fight anymore and I don't need alcohol anymore because I have you. Like you're the reason that I breathe. Like all this shit that, you know, my 14 year old ass would have ate the fuck up. But, but 10 years later, I'm like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> Eventually after some really pointless back and forth between the two of them, they do get together officially and are dating, boyfriend and girlfriend, whatever the fuck. If you thought this man was a menace before, like you're not ready. You are not ready for Travis Maddox, Abby's boyfriend, because there's like one scene where they're all in the cafeteria and then one dude ends up like slut shaming Abby, which is not cool by the way, but then Travis like beats the shit out of this guy. Like it's bad. And like, don't get me wrong, misogynists and slut chambers deserve to be slapped. But like, that was a dis, like, like I said, going back to what I said, that's scary. Like, even if you're defending me or, you know, getting back at some, you know, misogynistic dude who said some shit about me, like, that's, you do not go and try to like, kill this man with your fists. And then not too long after that, 
they're all at a club and some guy tries to dance with Abby and then Travis breaks this dude's nose and he almost takes out Abby too because when he swings Abby is like kind of like close to this guy he almost hits her and then he's like oh no pidge pigeon eh. like I'm so sorry like you know I never would have swung I never would have hit you blah 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 like Oh God. And what's so crazy is that Abby very rightfully gets mad at him. She says that he's just full of red flags, that he's, you know, just crazy, all this stuff. And then she tells him, she insinuates that he could potentially get physical with her and hit her down the line. And then this never gets brought up again. Like we just move on to the next thing. Like I feel like this happens in so many of these like abusive, um, toxic romances where like the main character, the girl will have like the self-awareness and say like you're toxic, this relationship isn't healthy, blah blah blah. But then they go back to that relationship and you know that is a very common pattern but then the book reinforces that this is like a good relationship, that that's love. Oh my god, you know what else? I completely forgot that this happened. When this happened I like burst out laughing but during one of the numerous amount of times that Travis just gets into a fight with somebody for no fucking reason, Abby breaks up the fight by jumping into Travis's arms, wrapping her legs around him, and kissing him passionately in front of everybody. I like, I kid you not, that is exactly what happens. Like, it's that meme of like the girl standing in front of her abusive boyfriend being like, baby, this isn't you, but like taken to the extreme. Like, what kind of Wattpad f Actually, you know what? No, that's an insult to Wattpad. Even Wattpad isn't that bad. Anyway, surprise, surprise, they end up making up don't ask me why or how they just do and then Travis invites Abby to meet his family so his father and I believe like four older brothers and they all get together and they play poker and it's during this game that we find out that Abby is related to a man named Mick Abernathy and Mick has been mentioned by America a couple times before she's told Abby you know Travis is nothing like Mick he won't hurt you like Mick did and um even though I've read this book before like I said I completely forgot what happened and I thought that like Mick was like an abusive ex that she left but apparently we find out here that Mick is her father and he was a sort of like world famous poker player. He was like teaching Abby to play poker as well. She was very good but when she turned 13 Mick sort of claims that she stole all of his luck and that was when he started losing games that he just like spiraled out of control. And now that the story has officially introduced Mick, he then shows up on the page. He shows up at a party that the four friends are at and he goes up to Abby and says, look, I need to borrow 25K. I owe this guy named Benny, who was like real bad news. I think he's like a mobster or something. It's never really explained, but Abby only has like a little less than half of that money in her bank account. So they basically all four of them pack up and go to Vegas and she's gonna make that money back. So she's there making money, playing poker, hustling dudes. And that is when she runs into her old boyfriend, Jesse, whose father and I guess now him run that casino. And Jesse says, look, I will let you stay here even though you're underage. I will let you stay until midnight if you agree to have dinner with me. And she says yes, but still doesn't make enough money by midnight. Don't ask me about Jesse, the boyfriend, like he literally only showed up for a quick second to make Travis really jealous because that is the function of all other men besides Shepley and Travis in this book. Like just like the way that all other girls besides America and Abby are like slutty bimbos, all other men besides Travis and Shepley are meant to act as like competition for Travis for him to like beat up or get jealous over. The next thing that happens is that Benny shows up, Benny the mobster shows up with his goonies, his henchmen, and they try to go after Travis and Travis very easily beats them up. And that is when Benny gets the idea, hey, why doesn't Travis come fight in, you know, one of these, I don't even know, is it like an underground fighting ring? I don't know. But he takes Travis to a fight. Travis wins very easily and makes a bunch of money. And that is when Travis tells Abby that Benny offered me this really great opportunity for me to keep fighting and make six figures off a fight. I would come down every weekend, he would fly me down from school, I would fight, I would make money, and then like we're like set for life. And Abby is like, fuck no dude, this guy Benny is scary, you will always owe him, he will never let you out of like whatever agreement you have, don't fucking do this. And you would think that Travis would listen to his girlfriend, would recognize, hey, Abby has a lot of trauma surrounding this man and like involvement with her father, like all these things from her past that she's actively tried to like run away from. Maybe I shouldn't dive headfirst back into that trauma. 
But of course, Travis doesn't know how to think about anything other than himself and his own whims. So he basically tells Abby, hey, um, this is gonna be really good for us, so I'm gonna do it. And eventually you'll realize that I'm right. And for once in her life, Abby actually puts her foot down. And that night, oh, this is actually so scary, like looking back on this now that I'm describing it, Abby recognizes that Travis is so unhinged and terrifying that she has to sneak out of the apartment, lie to him and say that she's going to do some laundry, take her clothes, ask America like secretly to take her back to her dorm, not actually go to her dorm, go to America's vacant dorm and sleep there just in case Travis tries to come after her. Like, it was like a whole stealth operation and it was terrifying the length she had to go to to get away from this man thinking that of like what he would do. And she was right to do that because Travis shows up at the dorm, he's banging on her door, so the door where her and her roommate live and like she's in America's room like a few doors down. And oh my god, I feel so bad for Abby's roommate this entire book. She has had to put up with so much shit, okay? That girl deserves like a Nobel Peace Prize. She is the hero. Of this story. So Travis is like banging on the door, he like pushes his way into the room, then finally realizes that she's not there, but he still sits in the hall outside her door the whole night. Terrifying. Like I it's it's not it's not funny. It's really not. Like it's it's genuinely scary. This man is scary. The two of them end up running into each other on campus the next day, and Travis lets her know that he said no to Benny, that he's not gonna take the deal, but for her it is too little too late, which thank fucking god. And I'm pretty sure that this is the conversation where once again she has this like super self-aware reflective moment where she is like our dynamic isn't healthy, the fact that you see me as like the only thing that you need in your life as your salvation that is not good for either of us. And I just don't understand why authors will put these moments of like awareness and understanding and like genuine like reflection and they'll have like the the female protagonists often say these things and then just like put them back in that same shitty dynamic and then like celebrate it and say that like that's love. Like I just, it bugs me so much. Like this is the shit that really bugs me. Cause I'm like, you know what you're doing. Like you, you know what you're doing and you're doing it anyway. So the two of them revert back to friendship or whatever their approximation of friendship is. And then Travis does this really shitty thing of the many shitty things that he has done thus far and will continue to do. He basically manipulates Abby into keeping her promise of coming to his house for Thanksgiving to be with his family. And she agrees, God, Lord knows why I feel so bad for her, honestly. But she agrees and she goes to the house and they basically like pretend to be a couple. Um, like I said, he's manipulating her and even admits that he is manipulating her into staying and, and being with him and putting on this show. So yeah, the two of them are pretending to be a couple and they actually do end up having sex and it's boring, it's lackluster, it is bland, not even vanilla. Like what's an even like blander flavor? Like, I don't know, it's like ice cream with no flavoring. Is that a thing? Cause, Cause that's what they are. And then after they have sex, Abby is like, you know what? I can't deny it. I love him. Like no matter what, like I wanna be with him girl, I'm telling you, please go to therapy. Like I'm begging you, God. But anyway, she decides that she wants to be with him again. And then right when she goes up to him to tell him that, he basically says, you know what, you're right. We shouldn't be together. And I agree, like, let's not be together. On top of everything that's so terrible about this book, now you're gonna throw in miscommunication. Like, I, you don't want me to like this book. Like you are doing everything in your power to get me to hate this book. Travis and Abby stay away from each other and it's not until one night where Abby and America are back at his apartment looking for something that America left there when she was with Shepley that Travis shows up. He walks in the door with one of the like many anonymous, I think she had a name, I honestly can't remember, this girl um, that he's hooked up with before. America is pissed, Abby just wants to leave and everyone starts fighting and it snowballs into America breaking up with Shepley. So the two couples have broken up and they don't really see each other. And America and Abby decide that they're going to hit the town. They're going to go to a club. They're there dancing and they're, you know, trying to dance with dudes. But every single time that they dance with a guy, he suddenly ends up disappearing from the dance floor. And then they figure out that Shepley and Travis are there and they're purposefully pulling away these guys and threatening them to not dance with the girls. They're so smug about it and the girls don't really like fight them that hard on it. And it's just, it's not cute. Like this is so like, oh, like my skin is crawling. I got the heebie-jeebies, I hate it. So Abby ends up backsliding back to Parker, the guy from the beginning of the book, who actually do really like. 
and they're going on a date and Travis shows up and interrupts and tells Abby, I have a fight coming, will you please come with me? And Abby dishes Parker to go to the fight. It's like a pretty rowdy fight. Travis really has to like fight back and the crowd is kind of going crazy. And Abby ends up getting like pushed to like the back of the crowd and pushed up against this wall. And then this really creepy like rapist dude shows up and is like inappropriately touching her and assaulting her. And Travis like sees that and tries to get to her, um, but he can't because the crowd is like pushing him back into the ring. I think Shepley notices and like helps Abby and like gets that guy off of her. And then everyone hears police sirens and then everybody is just like running and trying to get out of the vicinity of the fight. Travis then proceeds to beat the shit out of that like creepy rapey asshole, which deserved, I'm not gonna say anything about that, okay? Um, and then he like also wails on the guy that was like pushing him back into the ring. And he takes Abby back to his apartment and they're both kind of like shaken up by what happened. Like every other romance novel of this genre, I guess you could call it toxic abusive romances, we are just going to sidestep the sexual violence that just occurred to focus on the terrible relationship at the center of this novel because that's how that works. Because lest we forget, sexual violence only really matters when it disturbs the love interest. You know, who cares about the survivor? You know, the woman that it happened to? No, we, we gotta we gotta zoom in on her love interest and, and see how horrible he feels about it, that he wasn't there to protect her or whatever the fuck. I just, I can't stand it. Travis ends up apologizing to Abby, saying that she shouldn't have been there at that fight. And he admits to her that he only showed up to her date with Parker and asked her to come with him to the fight because he wanted to prove to Parker that Abby was still his. And Abby is just like so shocked at the fact that Travis would do something like that. Actually kind of really fucking sad to read this because she finally realizes like, oh, everybody was right. Everybody who warned me about you was right. Like, you only see me as a possession, as like a thing for you to have. Then we proceed to what is quite possibly the most terrifying scene in the entire book. Like, I don't know how I didn't remember this happening. I think I might have trauma blocked it, to be honest. Abby ends up going to this frat party where Travis is and she, you know, he tries to get back with her. He tries to apologize, but she stands her ground um, and Travis proceeds to get horribly drunk and he starts like yelling at the top of his lungs about her and just like embarrassing her, humiliating her. And then he ends up picking her up, like physically picking her up and like walking out of the party with her. Abby is like, you know, let me go. She sees America. She's like, America, help me. And then America, who I'm convinced at this point, that girl's not your friend. That girl doesn't even like you because America sees them. She sees Travis physically taking her friend somewhere. She's saying, no, leave me alone, put me down. And America kind of like laughs it off. Like, oh, ha ha ha. Like you guys should just get together already. Like, you know, what the fuck? <laughs> And then it gets even worse because Travis puts her in this car and tells the dude driving the car, take me to my house or else I will beat you up. Like I will hit you in the face. I will punch you. And this dude is like terrified knowing who Travis is. So then he drives them to the apartment. Travis picks her up again, physically takes her into the house while she's like fighting him back. And like, I, kidnapping, that's what that is, kidnapping. And this dude doesn't call the police. Like, I understand maybe in that moment you're scared. You, you didn't want to like phone 911 and be like, this dude just like took this girl. I'm sitting outside of the apartment. Here's the address. Like, uh, you just witnessed a crime. I'm pretty sure you were an accessory to a crime. Like, what the fuck is going on? Anyway, after that absolutely insane criminal act that Travis just committed, you are not going to believe this. You're not going to believe what happens next, okay? I want you to guess what happens next. Does she call the police? Does she fight him? Like, you know, find some kind of weapon or something and hit him over the head, knock him out, run away? Like, does she get a restraining order? No, no. Do you wanna know what happens? <laughs> they get back together. For like the 87th time, they get back together. And I, at this point I gave up. Like, this was the point in the book that I really just said, fuck it. Like, uh, brain off, turn it off. There's n no, don't have a critical thought in your head while listening to the rest of this book. Don't do it, you'll only hurt yourself. And thankfully, I think the book knew that I had reached my limit because it mercifully ended not too long after this, but not before the most batshit series of events occurs, like at the very last part of this book. So Travis has like another fight and Abby's there, of course, they show up and then 
at some point during the fight, I don't know if it was like faulty wiring or what the fuck happened, but a fire breaks out and everybody is like running for their fucking lives, okay? Like it was, I was like, are we ending this with like death? Like what the fuck is happening? And it kind of seemed that way because Travis and Abby get split up and Abby ends up running off to find an exit with uh, Travis's brother Trent, I think is his name. And then Trent and Abby get split up. And then Travis and Abby manage to, you know, get out of the building, like literally right before it goes up in flames. And they can't find Trent, like they can't get in contact with him. And for a second, I really thought like, oh shit, is he dead? But of course not. Because this book, this book doesn't know stakes. Like there are no stakes, there's no tension, there's no drama, there's no nothing, because nothing fucking matters. So the last scene I can remember in this book is one of the most, it's one of the most cursed things I think I've ever read in my life. Abby and Travis are together and I guess after going through this like near death experience, Abby's like, do you want to go to Vegas for one night? And he was like, oh, like, what will we do? And she was like, I don't know, what will we? Basically, they get married. Like, long story short, they go to Vegas, they get married. She's 19, by the way, 19. They get married, and the book ends with her getting a tattoo to match his. By the way, a, a while ago, I think, like, within a week of them dating, he got a tattoo on his wrist that said pigeon. For all the reasons that you should break up with him, I feel like that would have been number one on the list. Like, that should have been, like the biggest red flag, like ever. She gets a matching tattoo after they get married that says Mrs. Maddox. <sighs> I don't know what you, I don't know what to say about that. I don't know what you want me to say. I have nothing to say. I'm fairly sure that there's a sequel to this book. I'm never reading that. Never. And I know I say that sometimes on my channel that yeah I'm never gonna read something and then I do. Not this time. Like like never, ever, 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 ever. I do not care, like never, never. So The Beautiful Disaster film has released on demand in the US and I, everything that I've seen about it just confirms the fact that it is just going to be like so tonally different from the novel. Like I'm looking at this poster and it's not giving me like toxic, abusive, melodramatic, Wattpad-esque novel romance it's it's more giving off the vibe of like 2000s straight to dvd or made for tv rom-com you know and that is perfectly adequate okay the bar is literally in the deepest depths of hell so there is i don't really think that there's anything this movie can do that will piss me off as bad as the book did It'll probably be cringy. I will probably laugh a couple times, not because of anything intentional in the film, but just because it's a bit ridiculous. But I would much rather do that than want to carve out my own eyeballs from how much I hate the experience, which was, you know, roughly what reading the book was like. Anyway, without any further ado, let's jump in to a beautiful disaster. And I, you guys, I'm looking at this runtime it sits right with my soul like it feels good this is they did this for me because it's only an hour and 35 minutes <sighs> oh that's so lovely like we need to bring back short movies like I am tired of movies just like putting on all this extra padding for no fucking reason like short and sweet that is where it's at I'm already excited I'll leave this mess See, what did I tell you? This movie was gonna have me laughing my ass off because of unintentional shit. What was that font? Freaking Times New Roman sans serif ripoff. And also, the girl who was singing in the intro music sounded like a knockoff Taylor Swift. I love this already. I'm obsessed with this production already. Oh, hey, oh, by the way, we don't talk about the circle, it's a secret. What's a secret? Exactly. Okay, Fight Club knockoff. Shake in your boots, boys, and drop your panties, ladies. I give you Travis Madoff Madness! You know, this isn't for me. I'm gonna go back to the Germans. Oh, here we go. Oh! Girl, why is your hand on him? Man. Don't sniff it. Please don't sniff it. Come on, Travis! I like that they haven't made him this like, ooh! Oh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. I just, I can't, I can't be dealing with like other people's blood. Girl, wipe your face! 
face. There's no, there's no way you're, he's not that, he's not all that, that you're not going to wipe the blood off your face. Fuck off. Sorry about your sweater, pigeon. Mm -hmm. You got my cash cow, baby. Oh no. Oh no. I was afraid of that. I knew this would happen. I knew that even Dylan Sprouse, not even, no, nobody could save that nickname. Like it is an irredeemable garbage dump of a nickname. And like in these romance novels, the guy will always give the girl some kind of nickname, love, sweetheart, cupcake, whatever the fuck. But like, I, tr I truly have never heard a worse one than Pigeon. The moment he calls her Pidge for the first time, I might have to like actually pause and pace around the room for a hot second. Pigeon. Abby. My name is Abby. Travis. Travis Maddox. No. No, we're gonna, no. It's not good. It's not good, but it's not the worst. It's bad, but it's not that bad. It's, it kind of just like is, and it's a little icky, but not too icky to the point that like, I don't, how do I? Dylan Sprouse is very charming. I feel like maybe if it was anybody else, it would be so much worse. Like it's already not great, but it would just be so much worse if it was anybody else. He's there, isn't he? Yikes. That's a bad photo. <laughs> That's a really bad photo. Girl, no. Absolutely not. That one's my favorite. Ms. Abby, would you care to educate us as to why Nash's equilibrium is irrelevant to game theory? Irrelevant? I can't. Well, then perhaps you should focus a little more on it. Well, but that's because it is relevant. The humor, like the whole like, panning to Travis behind her while she's like audibly saying that he's so hot and like the teacher catching them and then her like having the perfect answer like the whole script just it gives me like I said like such like 2000s made for tv rom-com like it's very pedestrian and when I was younger yeah sure I ate it up but like now I just I don't know it's it, I mean it's it's fine but it's been done before It's, uh, it's the wind. How long have you been captain of the Frisbee Club? Oh, oh no, 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 I'm not oh. captain of the Frisbee Club. It was a joke, it was a joke, I'm Parker. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Abby. No, that was kind of cute. In a very, like, obvious, mute, cute, fanfic kind of way, but like, no, they kind of got me a little bit. Like, okay. Hey, Abby, staying over. Just stay out of Travis's room, all right? Oh, Lord. Girl, don't go in there! Oh! Girl, why the fuck? Jesus! Enjoy the show. I have to say something, because I've noticed it so much in the last 20 minutes alone. Like, it's a glaring, like... I don't know if you can say logistical issue or detail, but like the sound mixing, the soundtrack of this movie is so obvious and on the nose and just bad. Almost every single scene has this like backing track of like what I assume is meant to be comedic music, even scenes that don't necessarily need it. And then like just then when Travis showed up and it had that like, I don't know, it was like, like a whoosh sound effect or something like I said it once, I'll say it again. Actually, I said it twice, now I'll say it three times. This is just giving so much, like, 2000s, like, rom-com. Oh, man. Oh, maybe I should just enjoy it as that kind of, like, throwback and not think too hard about this. <laughs> Bitch. Don't look at him! I don't know, man. This is, this doesn't even feel like a rom-com. It feels like a sex comedy. There's no substance to their relationship. Then again, there wasn't any in the book, so I don't know what I was expecting. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not actually watching this, am I? This is not real. Please tell me this is a joke. No, this is crazy. <laughs> what am I watching? 
watching? What am I watching? No, just in case. I don't even know what to say to that. Like that was the most atrocious, ridiculous, outlandish, bamboozling, befuddling thing I've ever seen in my life. I take back everything I said. This movie is now, has officially become like bad in a different way from the book, but in an equally painful way. Oh, hey! Parker! Parker. Abby, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, it's a long story. <laughs> Hey, that um, man looks 35 years old. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, Parker. Really? Thank you. Here it is again, like exactly what I was saying. Like, it's it, they're so obviously want you to find this funny, want me to find this funny, and it's just like not at all. You know, I've always wanted to see Tennis and Drunk. It's considered to be Shakespeare's most violent life. You don't love violence? No. I was something of a tomboy growing up. The, I, those things don't correlate, girl. What the fuck, Abby? You don't respond to any of my texts, and now you're here dressed like that with your titties hanging out. But you're not hanging out. This is a taste- Stop, stop. Pause, pause. It's so bad. It's so bad. Like, what is this? Her breasts are distracting you? Shut up. Shut- I li like, literally shut up. D Chris- Ugh. How much longer of this movie is there? Okay, another hour and eight minutes. Remember when I said that God bless this movie is only an hour and a half? I take it back. It should it should be a 20 minute movie, a short film. Like I I cannot, I, I have to watch this for another hour. If he manages to lay a hand on me, I'll go without sex for a week. Ooh. A month, three months. Three months? That's impossible for someone like you. Okay. Right, because men are just like absolute maniacs. Like they have no control. They're animalistic. Like, what kind of shit is this? How are you gonna kill me, big boy? This movie is so unserious. Like they were in that writing room, just like throwing ideas at the wall. <laughs> I'm saving the upper left sock for a few. Bitch. Can cover those up. Bitch. Excuse me. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Not the lullaby. Whoever was in there doing the sound mixing for this movie, you are the most unserious individual I have ever heard of. Open the door. Get out the car. <laughs> Yeah. Please get out the car! Oh, it's okay. No, he's a maniac. He is gonna hurt me. Leave the car! Oh, going to hurt Leave me. the car oh, now! Get out the fucking car! The okay, fucking okay. car! Okay. Leave the car! Okay. Go! Okay. Go! Okay. Leave the car! Okay, okay. Go, please. Go now. I'm gonna harp on this scene for a little bit and take it a bit more seriously than it needs to be, because when you compare this scene to the book, I feel like the tone is so different. Like in the book, this is like another scary moment from Travis when he was being possessive of, of Abby and like demanding she get out of the car and stuff. Like it was it was just like the beginning stages of like the red flags in, in their relationship or whatever. And it's a similar sort of sequence of events. You know, Travis is banging on the window. He's saying, come with me. But it's it's very much played for laughs like the soundtrack parker's overreaction everybody yelling at the same time travis like when you look at the bare bones of it it's like travis trying to like control abby which was the same sort of function in the book but like now it's being played off as if it's like something funny but also at the same time everything about this film is so unserious from the script to the sound mixing to the production to the acting like there is not like it's just I can't tell if it's cringy or camp, but I'm laughing, okay? Like, I just, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Oh my, baby bro's bringing home a girl. Guys, this is Abby. Abby, these are the moron twins, Tyler and Taylor. Hi. You're Abby, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, Trent. Mm -hmm. That's the most, uh, attractive that exposed. Is it Bitch, you don't have any eyebrows. Ladies, get on the front of my bike. So, uh... Abby, 
Have you ever experienced the uh, deliciousness of fried chicken from Kentucky? Okay, we had the Chime credit card or whatever. We had Doritos. Now we have Kentucky Fried Chicken. Like, okay, I see why this movie was made. Full. Beginner's luck. This is no beginner's luck. Well, I never said I was a beginner. Where did you learn to play? Home. Home? Is she gonna be honest about it? Where was that? Vegas. My dad told Oh, okay, she is. Lucky 13. Abby, you must have heard of her, right? She must be about your age. Is she gonna say? After all, this is you in the article, isn't it? Ooh. Okay, that was kind of cute. In a very like cheesy way. That was kind of cute. <laughs> Not this! Stop. I don't know what else I expected. I don't know why. Like, why would I think that they were above it? The like meta self promotion. Also, he was just eating Cheetos. They had like a bag of Lay's. Like, how many product placements are we gonna see? I'm. Imagine how tired I am. Like, just imagine. I'm exhausted. Uh, you're gonna miss me. So, here it's someone's birthday in two days. You here or you eavesdropped? Well, it serves you right for eavesdrop. <laughs> Whoa! What did I just get out of you there? What are you, half bulldog? Well, you groped me. I did not grope you. That was a poach. <gasps> oh, you are a snorter. Mm. I didn't I'm realize not that. Oh, they're gonna have sex. They are. Play fighting turns to sex. Okay, let's do it. I'm very uncomfortable with the energy in the room. Okay, yeah. I expected that. Alright, all this hype. Let's see it. What's going on? Shh. You okay? No. No, I'm not. Okay, um, Travis and I, we made out kind of aggressively. Erica, I don't know what to do. It's like, the logic goes out of my head. If I go back in there, I'm not going to be able to stop myself. <laughs> so you do like, Erica, I think I'm in love with him. Hey, baby girl. You okay? You okay? Don't greet her like this. It's too porny. You're not toxic. You're a cool guy. <laughs> oh, no! But wait, hold on, hold on. Wouldn't he know that that's her dad? Like, they know that she's lucky number 13. They know about Abernathy, Abby Abernathy, Mick Abernathy. Like, wouldn't he know that that's her dad? Or is he just not thinking straight? Like, that's, that's dumb. I was up all night worried about you. <laughs> that's rich. Shouldn't you be worried about your boyfriend or something? My boyfriend? Yeah, Mick. Ah, that's right. I saw the text. On your computer. Mick is my dad. And how often are you going through my text messages? <laughs> no way. That's terrible. Yeah, it well, is. What I the fuck? That. That's great news. Is it great news? Shut the fuck up! Yes, you invaded my privacy and then you turned around and ghosted me? Yes. Goodbye. Okay, I have to say, it's like not as bad as the book in that he didn't go and like bring... I think it was, was it, two other girls home and have sex with them very loudly on the couch while she was there. But still not, not great, not handled great. It's the almost birthday girl. Surprise? Yeah, surprise to some understatement. You even referred to partner. Well, he found you. Shouldn't have known that you guys would be hanging out. <laughs> well, I can trust him. Cool. Um, well, I'm gonna... Yeah, have fun. Yeah. Well, at least he's not getting rip-roaring drunk, yelling at her, and punching out any dude who so much as looks in her direction. So for that incredibly low fucking standard, I will have to give movie Travis some brownie points. What? Wait, go back, go back, go back. This dude's shirt. I, c I can't escape it. I can't es I can't escape the After franchise. I don't know why I thought I could in another Voltage Pictures production. It haunts me everywhere I look, everywhere I turn. 
I'm haunted by the After franchise. <laughs> I will never be free of this torment. This has been great. I'm gonna get out of here. He still has his little backpack. Come on, listen up. Oh my god. I'm twerking. Uh, the boy's like, no, we're twerking. No, you're not. This no, is this is, uh, yeah. Twerking. No. No, we have to stop. We have to, no, press pause. <sighs> you cannot tell me that this movie was not written by some kind of like AI generator. Like, this script was written by Chat GPT. I refuse, like, I refuse to believe that honest to God human beings wrote and directed this scene. I, no, I refuse. He's in the back room. Excuse me? Travis, the guy you're looking for, be honest with yourself and see this thing through with Travis. He's not good for me. You keep telling yourself that. I feel kind of bad for him. Hello, hello. Okay, thank you. Also, girl, you should not be doing anything with anyone tonight. You can, yes, you cannot give consent. Do you know how hard this was to put together? I did all this for you. I didn't ask you to do any of this. I, I know, that's the point. I did it because I care about you. Well, Travis, you're too late. Tomorrow the bet's over and you never have to see me again. And you think I'm just gonna forgive you because you're throwing me this really big surprise birthday party for my birthday where I don't know anybody. You said that already. Stop hiding what to do! Uh, okay. So, Pidge, you're gonna have to walk away from me because I can't walk away from you. Are they gonna kiss? Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh! Oh, no! No, 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 no. I can't do, I can't do barf. I can't, I really can't. I can't look at it. I can't look at it. Oh god, I'm okay, I have to fast forward without looking at it. How's college? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I, I haven't talked to you. I, I, I really miss talking to you. Oh, I have to go. I love you, Dad. So it's, it's my birthday and our last night together as roommates that maybe we do something special. What do you have in mind? Let's look in the magic drawer. Yeah, I wonder what she has in mind laying that towel down. Is there anywhere else you want me to decide? Yeah. Maybe here. Okay. Is it happening? Well, it's done now. Got that done with. Thank God. Let me just say, though, that, like, once again, just like the book, all that hype, all that build up, all the, like, more than half of the runtime of this movie is dedicated to, like, whether or not they're gonna have sex. Like, not even whether or not they're gonna have sex, but, like, building up to the moment when they're obviously gonna have sex, and, like... Happy ever nappy. Good morning. Good morning. Can I help you? <sighs> this might sound weird, but I'm gonna need you to come with me. It's about your dad. What about him? He's placing bad bets, and oh my boss. They're gonna break his legs if you don't come with me. How much do you owe, Benny? A hundred grand. A hundred thousand. What I know, the I know. Fuck? It's, it's all. I know. I'm doing all this stuff. I swear. I'm, I'm doing Gamblers Anonymous, and Debtors Anonymous. Is it Debtors Anonymous? Work it. Isn't that what they say? You expect me to believe that this man is in any way intimidating wearing that fucking shirt? Yeah, I'm Like, I don't... Oh, it's getting pathetic now. You in the blue dress. Stop. Oh my god, Zed! Another After Franchise crossover. I... I don't know what else I expected. I should have been expecting this. And once again, this dude is going to play second fiddle to the main love interest. Alright, fine. I've only got, like, what? I have 20 minutes left of this. I can do that. I can do 20 minutes. I'm gonna need you to give me these tips. Oh, excuse me? Come on, Abby. You're underage, you know you can't gamble when you're underage. It's illegal. I don't want to see you get in trouble. I got caught. What? Listen to me, Dad. Get out of the club, get out of town, don't use your cell phone, don't use any of your credit cards, and text me when you get a burner phone, okay? We'll figure it out. I'm so sorry, Dad. 
Can't let you down. Wait, I feel a bit bad for her. <laughs> what the fuck? Travis? Jay! Are you okay? Hey, we gotta leave right now, okay? Oh! Oh! For once I put- Awesome days to smart gun! What? Oh god, not another comedic fight. I can't take this. Do you have any idea what you just did? I wasn't gonna let them hurt you. They weren't hurting me! I was fine! I was handling it on my own! Whatever you're going through... We can figure it out. I don't want to figure it out! I have had enough crazy in my life! I don't want any more crazy! And Travis, you make me crazy! I'm just imagining all the people in their hotel room just trying to, like, sleep and they're just hearing this mess outside their doors. Shit! Girl, why? Okay, I guess we're gonna do this. Girl! Not this, not this. Don't do- no. There's a perfectly fine bed right fucking there. What was the point? So are we okay? Well, she totally bought it. I it over the chips, no problem. So what do you think she's gonna Ooh. do now? You gonna start working for Benny or what? Ah. I don't think she has much of a choice on this point. Oh, that's so shit! I feel like this is somehow like worse than the book. Cause like from in the book, she knew that her dad was trouble from the start, but like she really did like trust him and there was like a bit of a relationship there, so I I do I feel bad for her. No, Get no, it. no, I was just like Oh <laughs> You Betty, Jesse, you guys set me up from the beginning, didn't you? You don't owe Betty any fucking money. Get out! Get out! Get out! Out of my life! Get out! Give a Get out! resolved pretty quickly. I feel like this whole like Vegas plot line was handled much better in the movie. Like Travis is like fighting in that fight like for her. It's not because he just like wants to make money. He's not like purposefully trying to drag her back into like the pits of her trauma like in the book and dismissing her feelings. Like there's no third act breakup or I guess for Travis and Abby who break up every five seconds. There's no like Tenth act breakup. What bag is this? Jesse's. Who's Jesse? Doesn't matter. Does Jesse have a shirt? I. Yeah, I figured they'd find the money. He also has a ton of money in here. Actually, no, that's my money. You won? Yeah. Vegas for another night? That'll be a disaster. Let's do it. Oh, I see, because disaster, a beautiful disaster. Okay. Oh, thank God. Huh? What? They're gonna do like a whole sequel of them getting hitched in Vegas? Was that what the sequel book was about? I'm not reading that shit. I might watch the movie, but I'm not reading that shit. Okay, so final thoughts on the movie. It was bad in its own like special ways separate from the book like the book was terribly written had a terrible toxic love story at the center of it it was boring melodramatic it pissed me off quite a lot and travis maddox is like one of the most terrifyingly abusive male characters i think i've ever read about the movie on the other hand it was cringy, the comedy was not funny, it was way too focused on sex, like I, this was not a romantic comedy, this was like a sex comedy. Which like, it's fine I guess, I didn't know that was what I was signing up for though. But I will say, I'll give the movie some credit for 
completely doing away with a lot of the very toxic and terrifying elements of the story. Um, when Travis found out that Abby left after they had sex, he didn't trash the apartment. So brownie points for you, I guess. Then again, I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how much credit I can give the movie for doing that because I feel like there was no possible way that you could adapt that shit without making this movie into like a psycho thriller. It would not have read as a romance at all if you actually stayed true to the book. Um, just like the book didn't read like a romance at all. I guess if I had to pick between the book and the film, I would choose the film. I think I would definitely rewatch this with like friends of mine at like two times speed maybe just to see their reactions to the absolute ridiculousness in this movie. But other than that, I it really has no rewatchability. I don't know, I feel like if this movie came out in like 2011, 2012, people would have ate it the fuck up. But like, it's 2023. Like we've moved past stories and romances like this, you know? There are so many romances that I would just, I would die if they got adaptations. There's so many like good quality, very, very sexy romances out there that I want to see adapted. So to have people like churning out stuff like this, it is a little bit disappointing. Like, you know, we've evolved as a reading community, as a romance community. We've moved on to greener pastures. Anyway, that is it for me today, you guys. I hope that you enjoyed this video. And if you did, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment down below. Go ahead and let me know if you have any kind of history with The Beautiful Disaster, if you've read the book, if you've seen the movie. If you haven't seen either and you watched it all through my eyes, then um, I hope I made it entertaining for you. <laughs> If you guys want to find me or follow me anywhere else, all those links will be down below. I love you all so very dearly, and I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Bye!